Well, I think we'll get started. You all were so polite to get quiet right at the appropriate time. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce, without standing in front of her, today's speaker. Uh, it's Chelsea Harbuck, and Chelsea is a PhD student in my program, born and raised in Illinois, right? I was born in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> Undergrad degree at University of Illinois. She was misguided for a while and studied animal science, but then she saw the light. Right? <laughs> no. You were something before crop science. Uh, integrated biology. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're crops. So who should, am I your major professor? <laughs> So I try and do these things like from memory instead of interviewing you. Yeah, no, it's okay. Bachelor's of Science in Crop Science. Yes. Master's of Science from University of Illinois in Crop Science dash Plant Pathology. Glenn Hartman did some soybean aphid work, um, some green stem work. Anything else I'm missing there? Okay. <laughs> and published a couple papers there, and then came to Iowa State in 2015, August of 2015, and took on a pretty big project in my lab with soybean cyst nematode, and she's worked very hard, has done a ton of stuff, and we're gonna hear about it. So, without any further embarrassment to me, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, this is your afternoon episode of Mythbusters, in which we are investigating the myth of whether cover crops can help with the soybean cyst nematode problem. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Mythbusters, Mythbusters is a TV show in which the Mythbusters, Jamie and Adam, dig into uh, myths and try and determine whether or not they're plausible or busted. But as you can tell, my invitation to Jamie and Adam must not have gotten here because they are not here. Instead, today, your Mythbusters <laughs> but something doesn't look quite right about this picture. There we go. <laughs> Your Iowa State University plant pathology mythbusters. The myth we're discussing today has to do with whether cover crops can decrease population densities of, or maybe even eradicate soybean cyst nematode. And the primary reason we're really interested in this myth has to do with this morsel of data that's been circulated that originated from an extension agent at University of Illinois. This extension agent conducted experiments over four locations with two years, three replications, and three treatments. We have the bare soil, so like unplanted control, a cereal rye treatment, and an annual ryegrass treatment. And it looks like what they did is determine the, or <coughs> take soil samples and determine the soybean cyst nematode egg counts following these treatments. So what we see is that there, it looks like there's significantly fewer soybean cyst nematode eggs following cereal rye and annual ryegrass, and in one instance, even maybe eradication of soybean cyst nematode. Now, this data has been circulated far and wide and is really what a lot of people use to base their claims of cover crops having an effect of decreasing soybean cyst nematode. However, the researcher here himself, Mike Plumer, noted that additional research was needed <coughs> before we can make these broader claims. Now, we need to introduce the key players of today's myth. We have cover crops and the soybean cyst nematode. Cover crops are of increasing interest because farmers are implementing this practice into their uh, into their agro ecosystems at an increasing rate over the last several years. A big reason that for that has to do with the known agronomic benefits from soybeans or from cover crops, including helping mitigate nutrient leaching in the soil as well as uh, erosion control. However, by introducing this new component into the agronomic landscape, you also have the, uh, the potential for this component to interact with other components 
of the agro ecosystem. As you might suspect, being this uh, plant pathology seminar, we're interested in how these cover crops might interact with plant pathogens. More specifically, I'm interested in how these roots will interact with the soybean cyst nematode that lives in the soil. Soybean cyst nematode is a plant parasitic nematode. It is consistently the top yield suppressing pathogen in United States soybean production. It hatches as a second stage juvenile, or J2, where or following hatch, it will find soybean roots to penetrate form a feeding cell where it will live for the rest of its life cycle. And as it continues to grow and molt in the soybean root, eventually the, the females grow large enough that they actually burst through the soybean roots and are visible with the naked eye. They're growing really big because they're filling up with eggs. So as the soybean cyst nematode continues to mature in age, eventually her outer cuticle will harden, she will fall off, and that will become the cyst, which is essentially a protective barrier for hundreds of eggs. As this is a highly prolific pathogen, you might expect to see, in the worst case scenario, really severe damage in soybean production as a result of the soybean cyst nematode. Now, before we dig into my experiments, I think it is really important to first outline the possible outcomes of an interaction between the soybean cyst nematode and cover crops. And I can see three possible outcomes. The first outcome being the potential for an increase in soybean cyst nematode population density if the cover crops that are used can serve as an inadvertent host for reproduction of the nematode. Second, and maybe least interesting, is that there's just simply no effect of cover crops on soybean cyst nematode. And third, and probably of most interest, is the idea that some cover crops might decrease the soybean cyst nematode population density by one or more mechanisms. The mechanisms I'm presenting today are ones that we were able to, to test between my experiments as well as my lab mates' experiments. And We'll start with the idea that some cover crops might produce some root exudates that could stimulate the, the nematode hatch. And if the nematodes hatch in a soil where there's no suitable host, they will die. So that is the way of decreasing the population density in that instance. Then there's the idea that some cover crops could serve as a trap crop for soybean cyst nematode, wherein the hatched nematodes enter the roots of the, of the plant are unable to form an inefficient feeding cell, and then they subsequently die. Then there is a, an idea that some cover crops might produce some toxic allele chemicals that have nematicidal effects on the nematodes in the soil, uh, either hatched J2s or even the eggs themselves. And the fourth mechanism is kind of an indirect effect of cover crops where maybe there's some inhibitory allele chemicals that are left behind in the soil after the cover crop that can kind of inhibit uh, or make the reproduction of soybean cyst nematode on the following soybean crop less effective. What we know thus far when it comes to soybean cyst nematode and cover crops first begins with the host status. Um, we conducted some experiments in our lab that were published in Hanan's paper in 2017. For those of you who don't know, Hanan was a former graduate student of the Leandro lab. We conducted experiments to see whether or not soybean cyst nematode could reproduce on various cover crop species. And we observed little reproduction on the leguminous cover crops, and that's five females or less. And for reference, while that might seem like kind of a lot, we can observe at least 150, a lot of times more, females forming on a susceptible soybean. No reproduction on the brassica or the grass cover crops. For the field studies that have been conducted thus far, the results have been either inconsistent or non, not significant. And um, those non-significant non non -significant results 
often indicate that there's no difference between the cover crops and the controls. The greenhouse and lab experiments that have been conducted this far have a pretty similar trend of inconsistent <coughs> or not significant results. And both the greenhouse lab and field studies in some instances that have been published lack some sufficient controls in order to make adequate comparisons. To bolster the need for your Mythbusters today, we have cover crop seed companies that will advertise either their cover crop mixes, in this case, or individual cover crop species cultivars for reducing soybean cyst nematode populations. And in one instance, there's actually a radish that is advertised as eradicating heterodera species, which includes the soybean cyst nematode. And then in some instances, some of these companies are making a more broad statement of suppressing nematodes or reducing nematodes or a generalized nematode control. All of this makes it very clear that we need our Mythbusters. <coughs> in true Mythbusters fashion, we conducted our experiments on a wide range of scale from small to big starting with lab-based assays, greenhouse experiments, small plot field studies, as well as some on-farm strip trials. And these on-farm strip trials were um, a collaborative effort with our lab and the Iowa Soybean Association. And for the sake of time today, I will not be presenting results on these experiments. So just so you know, and you're not like, oh, where are those results? It's because I'm trying to save time and you'll see why. The treatments included in, the, in these experiments included two cultivars each of cereal rye, mustard, oilseed radish, annual ryegrass, daikon radish, and, some, and three cover crop mixes. And in the results, I will pre be presenting the cultivar name with the abbreviation of the crop type in front of it. And I know that's a lot to keep track of, so I've actually made some cheat sheets for you to reference um, in case you get confused during the presentation of results. Will there be a quiz at the end? No. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of these treatments were selected based on the fact that the cover crop seed companies are advertising them, either for soybean cyst nematode population reduction or generalized nematode control. And I do feel it important to also point out that the inclusion of the Aroostook cereal rye and the Bounty annual ryegrass was because those are the, the cultivars that Mike Plumer used in his University of Illinois data that is circulated around the country. No experiment is any good without a control. So the control treatments I want to introduce to you now include a non-cover crop, non-host control, which is I selected tomato. And you might be like, we live in a corn soybean state. Why the heck is she growing tomato and not corn? Well, some of my greenhouse experiments are grown for 60 days in the greenhouse in containers this small. Can you imagine growing a corn plant in a container this small for 60 days? I can't. So I opted to go with the tomato non-cover crop, non-host control. And of course I have the soybean cyst nematode susceptible soybean cultivar Williams 82 and an unplanted or fallow control and then for the hatch experiments, which I'm going to present next, we had additional controls of zinc sulfate, which is a positive hatch stimulant for soybean cyst nematode, as well as a deionized water, which is more of a neutral control. So for the hatch experiments, we're testing the myth of whether or not cover crops can stimulate the hatch of soybean cyst nematode. For this experiment, I had to come up with a way to collect some root exudates and soil leachates to use to test the hatch in. So I adapted my method from Noel and Socora, where I grew cover crops as well as the tomato 
and unplanted control in the greenhouse for 28 days after in, in sterile sand soil. After 28 days, I poured 30, 30 milliliters of water into each, of each container, they're this size, and I wait about an hour. After an hour, I poured an additional 100 milliliters of water into each container and suspended those cones over a beaker in order to catch the root exudates and soil leachates. The root exudates and soil leachates for each treatment were pooled together over four reps and they were filter sterilized using a bottle top sterilizer, bottle top filter. And those root exudates and soil leachates were used to set up the soybean cis nematode hatch studies. These studies were conducted in three groups, the first group being one cultivar from each of the species used in these experiments. Group B it was nine cultivars of each of the broadleaf species used throughout my experiments. And group C was five cultivars of the monopot species used throughout my experiments. And each experiment included a positive control of zinc sulfate, as well as a deionized water, and root exudates and soil leachates from tomato, as well as soil leachates from the unplanted control. We conduct our experiments in these six well plates and, con and collect data on the number of second stage juveniles hatched after three, seven, and 14 days. And we have these hatching sieves where the soybean cis nematode eggs start. So when the, egg, when the juveniles hatch, they swim down through the sieve and will stay in the well. So at the end of 14 days, after the sieve is done over here, we also count the number of eggs that are left unhatched in the sieve and use those data to calculate the cumulative percent hatch after 14 days. And then I use the cumulative percent hatch data in order to calculate a proportion hatch of the treatments compared to the unplanted control by rep. And that is our way of really trying to tease apart whether or not there's a root exudate effect beyond the soil leachate effect. In this figure here on the y-axis, we have the root exudate and soil leachate treatment. On the x-axis, we have the proportion hatch of the unplanted control. This dotted line here represents um, where the unplanted control is, right at one. So anything greater than one, stimulated hatch, be on the unplanted control. And anything less than one, inhibited hatch, compared to the no, uh, unplanted control. And then we have some different colors in the bars here. Uh, the green are the cover crop treatments. The blue is the positive treatment or positive control, zinc sulfate. Yellow is the neutral control water. Purple is the non-cover crop control tomato. The results from group A, we saw a great separation of the positive control, so we know that these experiments are valid. And then there was no uh, no separation between the crimson clover root exudates and soil leachates compared to the water control, and all other treatments were signi uh, had significantly <coughs> less hatch compared to the um, compared to the water control. So overall, it looks like the hatch in crimson clover root exudates and soil leachates was greater than all other other cover crops. However, not different from water. From group B, we also had great separation of the zinc control, which is great to see. Um, and there was actually more hatch in this experiment in the crimson clover root exudates and soil leachates compared to the water control. And the water control was not different from these um, treatments included in the bracket here. So overall, it looks like pretty much the same conclusion root exudate and soil leachate treatment to have a positive effect on soybean cis nematode hatch. <coughs> for group C, save the best for last, uh, there was again great hatch in the zinc sulfate control. The water stood out above all other cover crop as well as the non-cover crop treatments. So it looks like there is really no difference when it comes to soybean cis nematode hatch in root exudates from the grass cover crops. Overall, it does look like there is a positive hatch 
Um, a, a potential for positive hatch stimulation from crimson clover root exudates and soil leachates. And all the other cover crops were not significant in terms of hatch stimulation. And in some instances, it even looks like some of the cover crops might even inhibit the hatch of soybean cyst nematode. Regardless, well, we have one possible hatch stimulant, so we'll call the myth of whether or not cover crops can stimulate the hatch of soybean cyst nematode plausible. The next experiment we conducted was in order to test the myth of whether or not cover crops can serve as a trap crop for soybean cyst nematode. And these experiments were conducted by planting cover crop species as well as the soybean toma and tomato controls in naturally SCN infested soil where these plants grew for 20 days. Following 20 days, the soil was carefully removed from each root system and then I took the fresh root weight from each plant and then the roots went through a couple of freeze thaw cycles before macerating in a blender in order to help break down the tissue and really get all the nem nematodes out of the root systems and that yielded these nematodes that I'm able to count under the microscope for your information this is a uh, an adult male in its J4 cuticle and a couple of um, swollen J2s or juveniles. The data collected from this experiment included the total number of nematodes per root system as well as a fresh root weight. And then we used those data to conduct the analysis on the total number of nematodes per root as well as the number of nematodes per root gram. In this experiment on the x-axis, we have the treatments. This is where those reference sheets might come in handy for you. And on the y-axis, we have the total number of nematodes that entered the root system. And the positive control soybean in this instance is still blue. The tomato control is still purple. And as one would expect, we saw a lot of nematodes enter the roots of the susceptible soybean control. The next highest was the crimson clover. However, that was not different from the mustard, uh, mustard cultivar Pacific Gold or grapeseed cultivar Dwarf Essex. But overall, it does look like there's an, an overall trend of uh, root penetration being higher in broadleaf cover crops compared to the grass cover crops. And that is, uh, to reiterate that it looks like crimson clover could serve as a possible trap crop. And there is maybe a little potential for brassicas to be a trap crop, but it is definitely certain that cereal rye and annual ryegrass are not a trap crop for soybean cyst nematode. Regardless of that last bullet point, we'll still call this myth plausible. Now, it was important to conduct some experiments in the greenhouse to track the change in population density over a period of time in the soil. So I grew some cover crops. Oh. Um, so we did these deep production experiments. And before I get into deep production experiments, I want to kind of let you know why we're using this made up word. We have the de dictionary.com definition of reproduction, which is a natural process among organisms by which new individuals are generated and the species is perpetuated. To simplify that, it's just observing an overall increase in, in the population of an organism. So we have reproduction. There's not really a word that is the antith antithesis of reproduction, so we kind of just made up deproduction which we define as a natural process by which the number of organisms is decreased. So just observing the population decrease over time. For this experiment, I had to create a soil mixture of naturally SCN infested soil, field soil, as well as some construction sand in order to obtain a target initial population density for the experiment, as well as a gold soil texture. And those 
the soil mixture was used to fill containers of this size, this is 600 cc's, and uh, a subsample of soil was taken from each of these containers to serve as the indicator of the initial population density for each experimental unit. The cover crops, as well as the unplanted tomato and soybean controls, grew in the greenhouse for 60 days, after which the roots and the soil from each experimental unit were thoroughly mixed, and an, and an, and an additional subsample was taken from each experiment, experimental unit to indicate the final population density at the end of the 60-day growing period. The soil samples were processed to extract the soybean cyst nematode cysts. The cysts were then crushed to release the eggs of the soybean cyst nematode, and those are what we count to determine the population density of that soil sample. So we have the initial population density and the final population density, which we can use to calculate a percent change factor which is just the ratio of the final population density to the initial population density, and is essentially our way of determining how much change there was in population density over this period of time. In this graph here, we have on the y-axis the percent change factor after 60 days of plant growth, on the x-axis the treatment, and we have another line here at one. Anything above one indicates an increase in population density over time, and anything below one indicates an, an overall decrease in populate, population density over time. And again, the positive control is in blue, soybean, the tomato is purple, and the unplanted neutral control is yellow. So since we grew a susceptible so SCN susceptible soybean cultivar, the percent change factor for soybean was astronomical compared to all other treatments. However, it does look like there are some treatments, including this SF102 mix and the tillage radish, that were, had a smaller PCF compared to the, the tomato treatment, and even the tillage radish oops, had a smaller PCF value compared to the unplanted treatment. And in general, all, of, all cover crop, crop treatments, including the unplanted treatment, decrease the population over time. However, if you can see where this bar is for soybean above 10 and everything else is below one, I will tell you that I was careful in my analysis. I made sure I met the ANOVA requirements, but it still makes one wonder if that soybean bar can skew the results of the data. So I conducted the analysis without soybean and the effect of treatment is no, no longer significant. Now, since I had these containers filled with soil that previously had cover crops grown in them, I thought, why not try and test this myth of whether or not there are inhibitory allele chemicals that reside in the soil after cover crop growth. So I took some soil from this cone and put it in this smaller cone and planted some susceptible soybeans and grew them for 30 days. After 30 days, the soil again was carefully removed and we can see lots of soybean cyst nematode females developed on the roots. Those are what we need to count in order to test this effect so I needed to use a, a water spray to dislodge the females from the roots and collect them on a seed, just hundreds of females that I knew were gonna give me a backache later. So in this experiment we have on the y-axis the number of soybean cyst nematode females formed per root gram of soybean. And on the x-axis is the treatment that was grown in the soil prior to the soybean bioassay. As a reminder that these numbers are on soybean, I have a nice little soybean over here for you. And in this experiment, the treatments included in the bracket here were not different from the unplanted control. However, there are some treatments that were different from the unplanted control, as well as not different from the tomato control. Anything from this mix SF102 over, including tomato, 
appears to have some residual effect on soybeans' as nematode reproduction. And that's kind of interesting. Overall, it appears that there is no significant effect of cover crops on reducing the, per the percent change factor uh, compared to the unplanted or tomato control. So that myth is busted. But it does appear that we have some residual effects of cover crops on soybean cis nematode reproduction. So that myth we'll call plausible. Now it's really important to me to make sure that these effects that we're observing in the greenhouse can be translated into real world scenarios. So I conducted some field experiments at two locations, including one at the Muscatine Island Research Farm and one at the Northern Research Farm. For your reference, here's where those re research stations are located. At each location, I had two different rotations or fields. Uh, starting in 2016 with the uh, either soybean, corn, and then soybean, or corn, soybean, then corn. And each treatment, or each field had 10 different treatments applied to it, including two cultivars of annual ryegrass, cereal rye, mustard, one tillage or daikon type radish, one oilseed type radish, a uh, cover crop mix, which was a cereal rye, daikon radish, crimson clover, and an unplanted control. And then there were three soil sampling dates per year. The first one at the time of cover crop seeding, which is like late August, early September. The second pre-winter sample, usually mid to late November, prior to a hard freeze. Oops, and the last, a spring sample after cover crop termination, but prior to cash crop planting. The cover crop seed were planted using these fertilizer spreaders, and this is our way of simulating an aerial broadcast of the cover crop seed into the plots. Now these cash crop plots are four rows wide by 17 feet long, so I would just walk down uh, between the two center rows of the cash crop with my little fertilizer spreader, spreading the seed, and the seed would land on the ground like so. These are kind of difficult to see because they are mustard seeds, but they're there. Another part of the reason I wanted to use this method of seeding the cover crops was to allow as long of a period as possible for the cover crops to grow and establish. So by doing that, as well as planning my seeding around a rainfall event, we actually got some pretty, pretty good cover crop stand establishment. Now, as I mentioned, these plots were four rows wide by 17 feet long. So to, con to collect the, the soil samples to determine the soybean system and toad population density, we collected our soil samples from the center two rows of each plot. And these are the same center two rows that we came back to every time we soil sampled. And it's just our way of trying to mitigate the infield variability of uh, the dispersal of soybean cyst nematode populations. By having three different soil sampling dates, we're able to calculate two different PCF values. The first one being the ratio of the pre-winter population density to the at seeding population density, and the second is the spring to pre-winter ratio. For this presentation, I am including only data from one location, I'm including both fields, but just one year, and that is because the results are consistent among all experiments, and you'll see why it's not worth the time to present all of these figures. So, this is year two at the Muscatine Island Research Farm in the corn soy corn rotation, so that means these cover crops are planted following soybean in 2017. On the x-axis is the treatment, the y-axis is our PCF1, and again this dotted line at 1, remember anything greater than 1 indicates an overall increase in population density and anything less than 1 is it indicates a decrease. Well it looks like there's some variability here. The test statistic showed no significant effect of treatment on 
um, the PCF1 value. But we have another value to look at. Here's our PCF2, the spring to pre-winter ratio. And while it looks like there's more variability, there's still no significant treatment effect. Here's the PCF1 value for the so soy corn soy rotation. So these cover crops are seeded following corn in 2017. And again, there's no significant effect of treatment. And the same for the second PCF value, still no significant effect of treatment on the percent change factor. I decided to put all of these in a table to really emphasize how not significant these results are. Um, for all locations, rotations, years, and PCF values, we see no significant effect of treatment when alpha is set at 0.05. Overall, there's just no significant reduction um, of SCN numbers over all years, locations, rotations, um, treatments, and sampling dates. And that is an important caveat that this is just under these field conditions. We can't generalize for all field conditions, but we'll still call this myth busted. To summarize, it appears that some cover crops may serve as a trap crop stimulate soybean cyst nematode hatch, or even have some residual effects on soybean cyst nematode reproduction. However, oh, yeah, so those myths are plausible. However, we've observed no differences in uh, between the, the cover crop treatments and the unplanted controls for the PCF values in both greenhouse and field experiments. So that myth is busted. And with that, I would like to thank you all for being here today again. A uh, big thank you to the TOFA lab, especially everybody, everybody who helps with my field work and processing samples. It wouldn't be impossible without you guys. Um, everybody on my POS committee, as well as those that help with my field research at the, at the um, research stations, and the companies that donated seed to me, as well as the North Central SEER graduate student grant program. And I will take any questions. All right. This is the part of the TV show where there's questions. Yeah. <laughs> Did you record STS in those months? Did I what? Did you record No, we, we didn't um, really look mm -hmm. at the, the cash crops at all. It was mostly just when are you harvesting? When are you harvesting? So I like just trying to plan pretty much just the cover crops around the cash crop. You showed one experiment where you ground up the roots and look for penetrated mm -hmm. worms in there. Yep. And that's when I started to drift off for a minute, so I'll miss some detail. To, so which stage did you look at there? I, I did take notes on all stages that I observed under the microscope, but it was just says uh, either um, worm form, J2s, swollen J2s, um, males, and in, including the males in the okay. J40. But, I, but the data I presented is just on the total number of nematodes. Total numbers. number. But yes. So, so in, the red, in the clover, crimson clover, you see some, some later stages, so that at least they actually were feeding and started. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. How about nowhere else though, not in the grass or so, right? Yeah. You just have J2. So, mm -hmm. so um, Chelsea, I don't know if this is a dumb question or not, but to order to get track up, you also need to stimulate hatch of the eggs, right? So that the nematodes can fit. That would be part of it, but there, um, yeah, yeah, that would probably actually be a big part of it. Um, but there are some nematodes that are pretty dumb and just hatched constitutively that can enter the roots of the crop. So perhaps the the nematodes that I found in the grass species were the dumb ones that just hatched. But I guess, I guess to summarize, to be a trap crop, stimulating hatch would help, but then they also have to penetrate. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if they just stimulate and don't penetrate, then 
all these things are not hosts, they're going to starve anyway. So from a pest control perspective, it doesn't matter as much. With that, excuse me. Um, there is one other technique that you didn't mention about people talk about having these trap crops or these, these cover crops and giving the worms enough time to penetrate and then plow them under. Yeah. So you didn't yeah. talk about that at all, no, I didn't test that out. I think there's some concern in my mind about that backfiring, if, if it were a host at least, because um, we've done experiments, Chris in particular, back in the 90s where we decapitated soybeans growing in an infested field in August and the nematodes continued to develop on their roots uh, for a month or two after that. So uh, the roots don't, in a plant, surprisingly don't magically die the minute that you take the head off the, the top of the plant. And, um, so uh, something like that could backfire if you used a host. Now if you used a non-host, like a brassica or something, there would be no risk for it. I, I was wondering about in kind of that same vein, the difference between cover crops that overwinter in the field and the cover crops that don't overwinter. Right. So I actually, um, one of the experiments I didn't present on today is, um, is like a greenhouse outside greenhouse experiment where I am growing cover crops in a, in a larger container in the greenhouse for eight weeks. Then I set them outside in the winter to let them either die or, you know, with the crops that over winter not die, and then do essentially the same thing that I did with the soil from the deep production experiment. So I'm hoping to address that. We're, we're going to collect in the last piece of data from that experiment right now. I don't know to stop your finishing your Oh, it won't. <laughs> no, I'm determined. Bridget? Yeah. Um, on the soil and root exudate experiments, did you think about doing a chemical analysis to see what might be different between those exudates to see what's like increasing the hatch or decreasing the hatch? I, I thought about it personally, but I kind of thought it was a little outside of the scope of my research. Why didn't you suggest it? I'm not a, I'm not a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I, I, have, I have thought about it, but there is, it didn't seem quite sure. important to address unless there was like a really big effect on of something. Sure. Another thing, and, and we have these discussions because she's writing, as you can imagine, and all these chapters as well, is, is we, just, we just did the root exudate soil leachates that way, but there could be a real concentration effect if we didn't yeah, have, but too. doing all these things across all different size scales and we didn't have the luxury to investigate that. And so there could be something there that we were just way off on the concentration. Sure. Uh, I was just curious. So, I mean, you saw uh, stimulus and hatching and then uh, kind of that trap crop effect from the crimson clover. Mm -hmm. And then in the depopulation or deproduction science yeah. experiments, right. you tested the mix, right? Yeah. Uh, is that just like what's commercially available? That that's that one or two. Mm -hmm. Do you think that ratio of other things affected anything there? It could have something to do with it. Um, it's really hard to tell without like, you know, like separating the seed right. from the mix and then like, like yeah. Yeah, so that was beyond the scope of my research too, but it, it could have something to do with it. You didn't really explain it, but there are these mixes are commercially available. Some companies don't sell single species, they sell mixes. And mm -hmm. It's not real apparent what the, the rationale is behind that. Rationale's in the name. Soil cluster. Synergist. <laughs> Why is the DNS water patch compact? Uh, th so those nematodes that hatch in the DNS water are the ones that um, we talked about a moment ago, the, the, one, the nematodes that just hatch constitutively. The dumb eggs. Yeah, the dumb eggs. <laughs> so with potato cyst nematode, it's almost an on-off switch. You need root exudation. With soybean cyst, there's this level of constitutive hatch that I jokingly call dumb eggs. Probably not setting a good example for a, a new uh, professional, but they they just hatch when there's corn or anything. If it's just warm and moist, they'll hatch, and often they starve. Any other questions?
If not, let's give Chelsea one more hand. Thank you.